is our competition is really bizarre. Morning, early birds. Morning. Morning. Alrighty. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's Echo Clinic. Before getting started with introductions, we would like to share a general reminder to maintain confidentiality by not releasing any personal health information of the individuals being discussed today. Please mute yourself when not speaking by clicking on the microphone icon in the bottom left corner of your Zoom screen. Audio participants, please dial star six to mute star six to unmute. Prior to speaking during this clinic, please introduce yourself by saying your name and location. This allows those who are using audio to follow conversation as they cannot see the speaker. Okay, well, welcome to the ECHO this morning. We're all trying to get situated. Um, I wanted to start this morning with the folks that we have, just taking a moment, maybe not even quite a full minute, but just a little moment of silence and contemplation about the role of healthcare in, um, in some of the structural racism and um, Violence that we have in our own community, uh, you know, here in Allentown, and not far at all from our steps here at Neighborhood Health Centers. There was an episode this weekend that I think shows a real concern for how what is the response of healthcare in the midst of all of this. So I just want us to take a little moment to think about what can we commit to today to be welcoming, compassionate, and um, fair to people who need help. We'll take a breath for that today. Thank you. And because we have a packed day, I'll just say that we can we can be mindful in 15 seconds and we can think about our intentions in a short period of time for how to maintain a, a stance of being welcoming and healing, um, even when it's challenging. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started with some introductions. Uh, and uh, maybe what's your intention for today? And I'm going to start with you, Heather. Hi. I'm Heather Cromer. I'm the Behavioral Health Specialist with Population Health at Bethlehem Township. Um, I guess my intention for today is to learn anything I can that can help me be more mindful and better help patients that we work with. Wonderful to have you here with us. I'm Kevin. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my intention is to uh, is to uh, learn and to share what I know. Thank you, Kevin. Such a treat. Uh, I'm going to give Mary a second to settle in. Jillian, good morning. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jillian Beecham, and uh, one of the PACMAT uh, faculty and co-directors. And uh, my intention is is uh, to be present and, and learn as much as I can from everyone. Hi, Paige. Good morning, I'm Paige Roth. I'm program coordinator for addiction recovery services in the Department of Emergency and Hospital Medicine. And my intention um, for today is to 
remain calm and learn as much as I can. Some days it's easier to remain calm than others, isn't it? Uh, uh, Trisha. Morning, I'm Patricia Walters with uh, Population Health, Behavioral Health. And my intention for today is always just to uh, learn what I can from you guys. We're going to learn from you too. Um, Mary, you ready? Good morning, Mary Stock from the Family Health Center, making my breakfast because I don't have to go into the office today. So my intention is to um, be able to be very, very attentive for the next hour until my, my next meeting and learn from you all. Glad to have you here, Mary. Sophia. Good morning, everyone. Uh, BHI caseworker for the PACMAT team. Very happy to be here. Um, I believe for today I'm going to be present, be mindful, and be open to learning whatever I can from everyone. Good morning. Good morning, Sophia. Yamalisa. Good morning, everyone. Yamalisa here, uh, BHI for PACMAT as well. And um, definitely be open minded and share whatever knowledge I can today. Wonderful to have you here. Hi, Rob, how are you doing? Good, good morning, everyone. Uh, Rob Cannon, one of the uh, toxicologists at Lehigh Valley. My uh, intention is to try to <clears throat> learn a couple things today if I can. Great. Diane, good morning. Good morning, everyone. My name is Diane Beery. I'm the project coordinator for PACMAT and evaluation. Uh, my intention is to try and be as mindful and attentive as possible while celebrating my daughter's eighth birthday today. Ooh, happy birthday. Bill, how are you doing this morning? Good morning, uh, Bill Rowan here, uh, Lehigh Valley Hospital School Counseling Center, Program Director. Uh, really happy to be here and part of the meeting today. Uh, my intention for today is just to be as open as possible to learn as much as I can. And at the end of the day, to say that uh, I was able to impart something positive to somewhere along, someone along the way. Great. Judy, good morning. Good morning, Judy, uh, care manager at 17th Street with the New Valley Health Partners. And I'm here to um, you know, continue to learn and collaborate uh, with the community and learn how to better uh, care for our patients. Awesome. Uh, I see Drew. Good morning. I'm Drew Keister, Vice Chair for Education for Family Medicine. I'm excited to be here and um, <laughs> excited to be out on a walk as I often do for these meetings. So I am uh, intending to be present and, uh, and to learn and hopefully to enjoy some sunshine. Good morning, this is Luz Cruz, um, Community Outreach Liaison at the Family Health Center. Really wonderful to have you here, Luz. Uh, Angie. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Angie Calistra. I'm Director of Behavioral Sciences for Family Medicine, and I also oversee the uh, Behavioral Health and Addictions Integration for the PACMAD. Happy to be here. Sorry, I was running a little bit late. Right on time. Good. Good morning. My name is Christopher Nine, and I am a clinical coordinator for behavioral health with community care team. Awesome. And okay. Mary, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Stacy. Hi, everyone. I'm Stacy Cook. I'm the manager of consultation liaison behavioral health integration department of psychiatry. Great 
to have you here, Stacy. And we're sharing just one intention for today after we had a full 15 seconds of silence thinking about what is the role of healthcare and promoting equity, kindness, and healing for, for people who are struggling. We want to share a word. You are invited to pop that in there. Um, Terry, welcome. Unmute yourself and introduce yourself and attention. Terry, if you're having trouble you look like you're unmuted if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself and an intention there. I'd like to have everyone have a chance to join in. Ken Zemanik, uh, Department of Psychiatry Consultation Liaison. Ken, glad to have you here. Sure. Uh, let's see. I think then we'll go around the room. Am I missing anybody? Oh, Gina. Hi, Gina. Hi. Um, I'm Gina Hills. I'm the program coordinator for Neighborhood Health Center's Center of Excellence. And uh, my intention today is to present a case and to learn as much as I can um, from everyone here. And uh, Sorry that I'm I'm struggling. I have a new computer right now, and I'm trying to get Zoom to work on it, so I don't have to hold the phone. So that's why I'm on and off the camera. I apologize. Got it. All right. Anybody else that that wants to say hi? Right. Yeah. Good morning. This is Lane Turner. I'm the Drug and Alcohol Administrator with Lehigh County. Hi. Great to have you. Have an intention you want to share? Okay. Good morning. Good to see you, Abby. <laughs> All right. Well, this is a beautiful group to have gathered this morning. Really appreciative of our community here. Uh, so that's why I continue to appreciate the community. I'm Abby Lester and Heather. Hi, my name is Heather. I'm the COE um, intake and family specialist. My intention today is also to present a case. Great. Naomi, how are you doing? Um, uh, I am. Um, Awesome. And Jasmine is wandering around um, and will join us. Nurse care manager and door care manager. We have a sign on the door, so we hopefully don't get interrupted. If people start to stream in here. Do you want to share a hello for today? Hello. Um, I'm Jasmine, one of the nurses here at Neighborhood Health Centers. Um, and my intention for today is to um, be able to. Uh, learn with all of you and share this space with all of you as well. Great. Thank you. And uh, great to have everybody here. We're going to do another sandwich echo today where we start with a case, then move to our didactic with um, Kevin, and then um, <coughs> to another case. So I'm going to open up the first case for us, hopefully. Gina, you are up. Yes, uh, I am presenting today a 44-year-old uh, Hispanic male. And uh, my question that I would like to have answered by the group or help with is um, he is 
non-compliant with medication um, treatment. He doesn't have a lot of insight into mental illness and he has, um, he has some extreme symptoms of paranoia. And so I would like help from the group as in, um, in a way to engage him and to gain some insight. Um, he is not aware of this presentation. He did not help to develop these questions. Uh, he is a hardworking, motivated individual. He has not relapsed on opioids or opiates recently. Uh, he's been taking his recovery seriously. And again, the question is, we'd like to motivate him for treatment and help him gain some insight into his mental health. Uh, he has a relationship with his mother and his brother. Uh, he used to be close to both of them. Uh, the relationship was supportive. However, as his mental health has been deteriorating, he's now paranoid of his mother specifically. Uh, he's discussed with us that he feels she is um, part of the FBI or the FBI is paying her to follow him. He has an 18 year old daughter whom he describes as once having a close relationship with, but feels that they argue more now since she's an adult. Um, didn't really indicate that his mental health had anything to do with those arguments. Um, just, just the fact that now she's older and I guess, you know, has, has some conflict with him. Uh, he does see an LCSW for therapy at MHCLV, but he has no outside mental health treatment right now. He attended Mars for drug and al alcohol counseling in 2019. Uh, he did successfully complete the program there. It did take him two times uh, stopping and starting, but he was successful. Um, but he has not engaged with any DDAP since. Uh, he currently reports that he works in construction He's happy with his current employment. He was incarcerated in the county jail for two years, uh, several years ago, but he won't report why. Uh, so again, lives with his mother and brother. Uh, his last year in drug screen was performed in office at NHCLV on June 18th, and it was negative for every substance in the panel other than buke. Uh, he has a past history of heroin use. He's been in remission for one year while he's been on MAT. And uh, the last time he had a positive opiate on a drug screen was July of 2019. So uh, his medical conditions include carpal tunnel syndrome, uh, multiple congenital cysts of his kidneys, obesity, uh, and opiate use disorder. He is also diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder, uh, paranoid disorder not otherwise specified, and recurrent major depressive disorder. He is on Suboxone, 8-2 uh, milligrams, ibuprofen, Seroquel, methocarbamol, methocarbam hydroxyzine, and HCTZ. Uh, heroin was the substance that he did have history with and he does uh, meet criteria under the DSM for opiate use disorder. Uh, I don't, yeah, okay, sorry. <laughs> I didn't know if you wanted me to read all of how he made criteria, but uh, so uh, once again, he he did complete a program at Mars for drug and alcohol treatment. He hasn't returned since completing the program. Um, he has been engaged with care at NHCLV for a little more than a year. The mental health symptoms and the paranoia are a new onset. Um, I personally, I feel like they've, they've been there, but he's been very guarded about it, but it seems like the symptoms are getting much worse now. Um, again, his urine drug screens show no use of illicit substances, which is wonderful. Um, 
and his past mental health history is pretty unclear. He is self-reporting to us. Um, he reports that there's no diagnosis other than anxiety and depression. He has never, from what my understanding is, been to any type of mental health hospitalization um, or really even outpatient treatment. Um, a lot of motivators for him center around his 18 year old daughter. He frequently talks about him wanting to have a better relationship with her. Um, he also states that he wants to live a normal life. Uh, the paranoia makes him very depressed. He feels that he is being followed by the FBI at all times. Um, and that they are, uh, sort of bugging his apartment and putting devices in that they um, can listen to what he's saying. So a big motivator for him is not to feel those feelings. Um, interestingly enough, even though he doesn't have insight into why he's feeling that way. Uh, proposed diagnosis is opiate use disorder in remission, generalized anxiety disorder, major depressive disorder, and paranoid disorder, not otherwise specified. Uh, the identified treatment plan is to the uh, clinical goal uh, for us would be to increase his insight into mental health and mental illness and his treatment options. Uh, a shared goal is to feel less depressed. And another shared goal is to maintain sobriety from illicit substances for the period of one year again. Uh, he has agreed to take lo a low dose of Seroquel. He was given Seroquel in jail. Um, I should mention that he also is very um, ashamed of stigma around mental health. So he felt that Seroquel was okay to take because he says he knows it's a sleeping pill and that he's not crazy. Um, he is on 100 milligrams of Seroquel right now. He currently refuses to discuss any further mental health treatment with us. Uh, he has agreed to see our LCSW regularly. However, um, the challenge with COVID-19 right now is um, we do telehealth and, you know, as things worsen, we may have to increase that more. He does not want to do any telehealth because he feels his phone is tapped. So if, if there's a surge and we would have to go to telehealth strictly, um, I'm afraid we'd lose him in that aspect. Okay, now yeah, there's a case. Uh, yes. So I'll try and summarize that for you, Gina. You tell me if you think I've got that right, and then we'll go on to our clarifying questions. But we've got a a 44 year old who has a history of opiate use disorder in remission, doing well on buprenorphine for the last year, um, who has some deteriorating mental health symptoms and family relationships due to either new onset or worsening paranoia and delusions. Um, fairly stable employment and housing situation, a history of incarceration, um, motivated for a desire for a better relationship with his daughter. And, has a goal to feel better, uh, but some stigma and limited insight into the seriousness of the mental health disorder. Um, so significant resistance to treatment, um, no longer able to connect to telehealth, um, taking a little bit of Seroquel, but not willing to engage with outpatient or inpatient mental health or additional medications. And we're worried about uh, how how things will go with his undertreated serious mental health issues. That's amazing. That's a great summarization of it. Okay, thank you. Um, so a lot to chew on there. We're gonna start with clarifying questions from, uh, from our Zoomiverse. Um, so what else do you wanna know about this guy? And uh, let's try to start with our participants and uh, then we'll move to some of our faculty and we're lucky to have Dr. Zamanik here as one of our faculty. Um, 
from psychiatry to help us with this case today. Uh, but any questions that you have, what do you want to know about this guy? And so faculty, for all of you who want to know, Yamalisa, Bill, Kevin, Angie, um, and Gina, you don't have to get. <laughs> all right. What questions do you have about this guy? This is Gail. Um, I have a, a question about um, how is he managing in COVID? If he's deteriorating uh, in terms of his mental status or his, or his mental health status, do you have a sense of how he's managed in, during this time of COVID? Yeah, um, I, so I think it's interesting that um, a lot of these symptoms, like I said, they were, I felt like they were there, but he was very guarded and refused to be vocal about any of it. And now during COVID, he has really brought the symptoms to the surface and been super vocal. So I think that um, the isolation that COVID caused, um, and the fact that a lot of people are doing things over Zoom and telehealth and things like that definitely added to his decompensation with paranoia. Thanks. Great question. I have a yeah, question if he has any, this is Ken's man, question if he has any hallucinations, is there family history of any psychiatric problems? Wondering how much their, his guardedness has kept his psychiatric symptoms well hidden. I'd be curious if he got into jail because he was paranoid and beat somebody up. His delusions are rather bizarre. The FBI I think he's being bugged, and I'd be wondering about paranoid schizophrenia. And unfortunately, it sounds like he's being undertreated for that. Hi, Dr. Samanik. Um, yes. So uh, I think to answer, I'm going to try my best to answer this. Um, I, I think he, the problem is we're relying on him to self-report. Um, he has not disclosed previous psych treatment, so we can't get records from uh, any other treating agencies. And he has uh, largely been unwilling to discuss uh, these issues when we when we first started treating him he just he came across as very quiet um, someone who didn't really want to talk much about his issues occasionally he would seem a little paranoid um, but that in the past two months has really worsened um, when he is in the office he is looking out the windows he's ducking he now thinks that the FBI got to his boss and his mother um, he has missed work due to his mental health because he is, um, when he leaves his apartment, he states that he has to tear the apartment apart when he gets back in to see where the FBI put the uh, bugs and the microphones. I sat with him and tried to ask, uh, you know, what, what would you be being investigated for? He doesn't, he says he doesn't want to say um i've asked him if he's done something illegal he says no but he does admit to being incarcerated before as you brought up um was it for you know something that had to do with mental health and paranoia i'm not 100 percent sure because he also refuses to tell us why he was incarcerated um so you know it Again, not self-reporting. It, it may even be that he wasn't incarcerated. We, we don't have any real record on that right now um, to validate what he's saying. I agree that he's being undertreated. Um, I, I think the issue is his lack of insight, and we cannot get him to agree to treatment. Anything on family history, Gina, do you know? <laughs> Um, he, so again, that's a, that's a touchy one, right? Cause of stigma. Um, we have asked if anyone in his family has had any mental illness and he says no up to and including himself. Hmm. Now, <clears throat> question, the other thing I'm worried about is that since he's now thinking that his boss is now in it, any 
any access to weapons, any thoughts of harming anybody else, because just trying to keep safety and any or any suicidal thoughts to avoid the FBI and stuff like that. So I'd be concerned about, since now he's incorporated his mother and boss into the delusions, hopefully he's not the type who will act out on that. Uh, so any thoughts that we have of him on to harm anybody or himself? So that, that, that was my first thought. I discussed that with my immediate supervisor um because that's kind of where my mind jumped to but i will say he get he gave no indication of that um again we don't know why he was incarcerated so um mm -hmm. don't know if he has a history of violence um he has not said anything that would make us think that that's something that he could be thinking about but um i definitely seeing the level of paranoia um i worry about that seeing the way he's, you know, ducking and looking out the windows when he's at the clinic, um, hearing how he's taking apart his apartment every time he leaves. Um, yeah, I, I think that's definitely a concern of mine. Yeah, because uh, until it, it almost sounds like we're going to have any trouble getting into him into any treatment since he's denying it. And, uh, you know, maybe we could uh, try to, you know, convince him that <clears throat> it must be pretty anxiety provoking to have to worry about checking things. Sometimes people's minds play tricks on you and maybe this scared feeling interferes with your ability to have a good relationship with your daughter. Um, I would think you would maybe want some medications potentially to help lessen that anxiety and that fearful thoughts, you know, Medications like the Seroquel probably would need higher amounts in order to help uh, alleviate some of this anxiety because it must be pretty unpleasant having to be fearful all the time. Try to try to engage him that way, but he <clears throat> unfortunately, I have a funny feeling that until things escalate, until he's dangerous to himself or others, it doesn't sound like he's uh, engaged. Uh, this would be a guy who would not do well in any sort of group treatment setting because he would not trust anybody. So uh, working with a person one-to-one -one would probably be the best option and trying to, you know, uh, recognize and have him recognize that although he has those beliefs that you don't believe those things to be true. And because somewhere back in his mind, there's probably a little bit of kernel that does have some reality testing. Uh, and if you go along, and we want to make sure we don't go along with his uh, delusional beliefs. Thanks, Ken. Let's see if there's some more clarifying questions. And uh, we have a few minutes left for this case. So if you do have a great suggestion, we can try and jump into those also. But let's, any more clarifying questions? Not Lisa. <laughs> um, I do actually. So, with the paranoia being in the home as well, means he's he's not safe at home. Have have you guys restarted any CHW or BHI visits that maybe you can meet with him outside of the home, somewhere where he feels safe that he can have a conversation one on one. Um, actually, I, I've been meeting with him. Um, uh, typically, we meet either at the clinic or uh, outside of his house. I've only ever met with him outside of the house once because he typically requests to meet at CASA. Um, and he has come to meet with Gloria, which again, that's LCSW, it's not BHI, but uh, he's come to meet with her once um and has another appointment scheduled with her he hasn't really said much about not wanting me in the house i just kind of assumed that that would be an issue because what he was going through um he definitely will not use his phone to speak to me he has called me from his friend's phone because he believes his is tapped yeah okay and then the other 
Um, question is, <coughs> since he completed Mars, he must have, even though, I mean, he went through twice. I don't know how long ago that was. Is there still a valid release that you can possibly have a conversation with this individual counselor to help you get some insight on how to engage him in some level of mental health treatment? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I don't believe so, but I'm certainly going to look now <laughs> since you brought that up. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Bill or Angie, any question? No, the questions that Which I would have had, I, the questions oh. I would have had have been answered. So okay. I'm okay. good. Thanks, Bill. Just one thing I'd want to uh, be certain that, you know, as we work gingerly with trying to get him to consider uh, psychiatric treatment, that if he's feeling a little bit too pushed into it, will he start to include you in his delusional belief as you being part of the FBI and stuff like that? So we have, because it seems like his delusions are becoming, you know, first it's his mom, now it's his coworker, uh, or his boss, and, you know, I'm concerned that his delusional beliefs just starting to expand. I agree. They have, they have expanded over the period of the last two months. Um, he, he believes that his mother and his boss are treating him differently. And that's why he thinks that the FBI supposedly got to them. So I think that's definitely something we should be careful of. Good morning. It's Gloria Velasquez. Um, I just wanted to add to that comment. Um, I think that is a valid point. He kind of alluded to um, us as, as are we going to be siding with the FBI in my last appointment with him? Um, so that's a good valid point to, to think about, especially with uh, Gina on that case. Yeah, so he's likely, if he thinks that you're in the FBI, he's not going to be opening up any. Uh, and boy, it's going to be hard to reach this guy. Maybe we can try to do it by, you know, talking about, you know, he wants to have a closer relationship with his daughter, but if we bring that up too much, then he'll start to think that she's part of the plot, too, with the FBI. Um, you know, and unfortunately, a guy like this, Unless he ends up doing something that's imminently dangerous to himself or others, I don't see him agreeing to go for psychiatric treatment. Uh, he's just rather paranoid. I, I was curious with his substance use. Uh, I wonder, did he start that in order to help alleviate some of the anxiety related to his paranoia? And that's paranoia date back many years. I thought about that prior and I think that's a, a really awesome question. Um, according to his ASAM results, um, that's that he didn't really give a reason for, um, like some will say, oh, I was prescribed medication because I had an accident. Um, he didn't really give a reason other than it seemed like he was experimenting with marijuana and some other drugs and then it progressed to trying pills and then heroin um, back when he was younger. So um, it, that could have been an underlying reason for him to start experimenting at all. Um, I, will, I will continue to say though that um, I do think it's amazing that even with the paranoia, he's been really committed to his recovery. So mm -hmm. there, it shows there is some insight there into um, into some, you know, illness and uh, behavioral health, substance use disorder. Um, but again, he is always very, I don't know about his sessions with Gloria um, as the LCSW, but for me, he's always very like clear to keep telling me that he's not crazy. Um, that's a really big, uh, the stigma is just really, really big for him. I sort of wonder if he's complying with treatment because he knows the FBI in his mind is observing his every move. So he knows that he better not use or else he's going to be in trouble. So that may be one of the reasons why he's been, uh, how shall I say, motivated for staying clean. Because if he thinks the FBI knows his every move, 
has his phone tapped, he couldn't contact anybody in order to get anything. So that his delusions may be why he's been compliant. That's a good point. I, I never thought about that. Yeah. If you think the FBI is bugging your room, bugging your phone, you've got no safe place to go and get any drugs, then you don't want to get into trouble with them. You know, that may be, you know, maybe one helpful aspect of his paranoia, but uh, unfortunately, he, you know, he's going to need a higher dose of neuroleptics to get that under control. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, I almost perceive that until it becomes, you know, if he ends up doing something again, that may get him incarcerated. Like if he hits somebody, punches somebody because he thinks that they're doing something, uh, you know, I just hope it, it's nothing more than no significant, uh, doesn't act out more on his delusions and feelings of persecuted. Yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot to worry about. Um, what are, what yeah. are some thoughts from the, the rest of the group also about things that might be helpful for this guy? What kind of suggestions do you have? Jillian? I'm just curious what you think his motivation is for coming in to an HCLV. Like what, if, if he's not really that interested in medication or psych treatment, he's not really linked to Mars anymore. Do you think it's the, is it relationship with staff? I, I'm thinking along the lines of contingency management and kind of harm reduction and meeting him where he is. Like, what is it that, um, <clears throat> that helps him get there to those appointments? And could the daughter be involved or some sort of reward for showing up or just like focusing on what he is doing right um, for himself? And um, I'm curious about your thoughts on, on why he shows up. Yeah, that, that's a good question. I mean, so why I think he shows up um, is because he's not, he's living in this really sort of awful place right now paranoia wise and i think it's he trusts us for whatever reason and it's a relief for him to be able to go somewhere and talk to people without feeling judged um plus he is on uh suboxone so he comes to his appointments he knows that he has to come to get his medication um and i just think that he can talk like he can have his sessions with Gloria or with myself or Carmelo when he's there and he doesn't feel judged and he doesn't um, he feels it's a safe place so I think that he does enjoy coming because it so much of his life is spent in places that he feels aren't safe right because they're you know work used to be a safe place he enjoyed going to work but then as he says the fbi got to his boss and he knows this because his boss is treating him differently so i think right now um we're okay because he doesn't believe that the fbi got to us um but as somebody had just brought up um if he does start to believe that then i think we're going to lose him entirely mm -hmm. A lot of concern. Any other suggestions? Anyone in the group? Big suggestions, small suggestions? Have you guys explored, this is Yamalisa. Have you guys explored any holistic methods to manage his um, anxiety, paranoia, OCD? No, I don't think we have. Such as? meditation, hypnosis, anything that could be effective, you know, that he would be open to, to just having a conversation and, and giving him some options that maybe he can try things that he can do on, even on his own, um, that can help him some. And then the fact that he does have that relationship with, you know, he feels comfortable at Casa. So he's meeting with, with Gloria, which is, which is great. So I'm sure she has some techniques that she can recommend uh same with just checking in with carmelo uh even just a little bit more often maybe once or twice a week that you know they meet somewhere neutral where he's comfortable and and give him a safe space that he can start you know unloading some of some of the stressors that are 
causing the paranoia. I don't, I don't think hypnosis would be something we would want to do with a guy who's got delusional and paranoid. We would probably think that that's another way that we would be trying to control him, so I wouldn't offer that or recommend that. The meditation sounds nice. Um, one suggestion that I was having, I think I heard you say, Gina, that, that uh, you know, he can come to our office for his MAT visits and you can get to him uh, in the community and that works okay, but he, he often meets you here. Uh, but the real barrier has been that we, that all the behavioral health visits right now are remote and that that's a barrier for him. Uh, I'm wondering if we could set him up in the office to have a, a visit with Gloria that's not on his phone, whether he'd be willing to do that. Um, no, at, so maybe I, I wasn't clear. Uh, he does come to the office to see Gloria. My, my concern was there's a, an uptick with COVID right now. And I know um, in the beginning, we were doing basically all of our visits remotely. And I'm just afraid that if there is a surge with uh, coronavirus, where we do have to go remote again, that we will lose him completely because he is, he is very afraid of the phone, of the video visits, especially. Um, yeah, so that was my concern. But he is coming right now, um, bi-weekly, to see Gloria. Great. What are some other thoughts? Anything else? We've got to wrap it up, but um, we've got time for one more suggestion. If we've got something out there. Hi, everybody. How much are people? Oh, go ahead. Uh, I was curious. I was wondering how much are people trying to gently suggest that, you know, although he's fearful about his boss and the FBI, that he's entitled to that belief, but, you know, I have difficulty believing that, uh, to try and see if there's any way of, uh, you know, lessening the intensity of the belief system. I doubt it will work, but, I mean, because unfortunately I think he's going to need you know, some antipsychotic agents to lessen that. Uh, but th hopefully he doesn't try to get people to collude with his scary thoughts and his paranoia. Um, I, I have tried, I can only speak for myself. Uh, my visits with him, Gloria's, uh, I'm sure different, but uh, I have tried to sort of break down the beliefs uh, to to ask him why why the FBI would be following him um, if he's committed no illegal activity. Uh, how does he know the FBI is sitting in front of his house in these unmarked cars for him? It's an apartment building. Maybe they're there for someone else. Um, things like that. And he, he seems to actually have an answer um, or at least one that he believes for each scenario. And then what I find happening is he starts to get really anxious. Like it, it's it working him up. And I, I feel, um, you know, I'm not a therapist. I'm, I'm not an LCSW. Mm -hmm. So I don't really feel qualified to work someone up and be able to deescalate in that way. Uh, I know Gloria's still here. I don't know if she wanted to answer that at all with uh, talking to him about his delusions? So um, the, the one thing is, because it's more of like, I'm trying to build the trust with him because of all the paranoia mm -hmm. right now. Um, but the mm -hmm. main thing is the motivation he's thinking, or not the motivation, but the delusion that he's thinking why the FBI is following him is something that he's done in his past. He served time already. Um, he thought he did the time served, but he's worried that somebody else has dropped information to the FBI and now his biggest fear is serving time in a federal pen um, and that's mm -hmm. to quote him so that's a, a big piece with it like he has not disclosed whatever um, activities he was doing in his past or what kind of trauma he's been through like I'm not at that point mm -hmm. yet that may help with the underlying mm -hmm. paranoia that's going on yeah I, I would probably just because people with delusional beliefs will have an answer for everything uh, I would just probably, you know, rather than question him about why, because, you know, it's a belief system, he'll come up with 
anything and you know you can't shake people from their delusions uh all, all you could do to sort of get some level of trust uh, i would probably just acknowledge like i understand you have your beliefs about the fbi and all of that i have trouble believing that we're not, you know we'll have different sort of opinions on that but that doesn't mean we can't work together you know and you have your beliefs i have mine and uh and just sort of agree to disagree because, you know, the more we ask him the more about, well, why, then he can, you know, add more and more layers of uh, things to his paranoia. Why, you know, well, I, I, if they're now outside the house. What did I do? Well, and, and he can come up with more and more, you know, more fantastic delusional stories. So I would probably just when he talks about it, I would say, you know, I understand that you have your beliefs. Uh, I, you know, I don't, uh, you know, I don't agree with them, but we're going to be free to disagree. And I, I, I would uh, not try to have him elaborate more on his delusional beliefs. Hi, everybody. It's Sophia here. Um, just one quick question. I mean, I know we were talking about all of his behaviors that are contributing to his thoughts about the FBI and him being followed, but is he able to identify or have you had the conversation with him about any healthy behaviors that help him manage these FBI thoughts or any behaviors that would get him to focus on anything else other than being followed or debugging his room or anything like that? Any healthy routines that he has? Um, hi. That's a good question. I, I, for my part with him, was focusing on his routine of going to work. Um, of course, now the paranoia has shifted to his boss at work may be part of the FBI, but before that, um, this job, it was a good outlet for him. It was a motivator for him to, to not use uh, heroin. So I I was focused on that setting him so um i didn't go there but yeah great gina thank you so much for sharing the case and we'll um write down the recommendations that we have and anybody if you have uh any great resources or articles that support some of the suggestions that came up please send them to us at uh, project echo and we'll post those as well um uh, or you can put them in the chat and we can collect them that way. So if you're multitasking and you find something really wonderful to share, just plop it in the chat and, uh, and we'll get that out for you. Uh, so let's transition over to our presentation. Kevin, you ready? Yeah. Awesome. And are you sharing your screen? Um, I certainly can. Hold on a second. Thanks. Let's see. I got to uh, bring the lecture up. So these, um, Abby, these slides are the ones that, uh, Naomi shared with me last week. So they're going to have your name on it. So <laughs> okay. I'll, be, I'll be portraying you. I'll have to transpose that. All right. Thank you for putting that suggestion in there. Sorry, this is taking me so long. Having trouble um, back to the screen. I'm not sharing it now, am I? Nope. Okay. 
Just not accessing the Zoom buttons. Oh, Got a bunch of things. I'm going to need permission for that, I wonder. I need permission for that, though. Because I'm here. OK. Uh, how about now? No. <laughs> Sorry for our technical difficulties, team. How about now? It says I'm sharing my screen. Yes. Can you see it? Yep, we got your desktop. Okay. There you are. There I am. Okay. So, I'll be playing, uh, I'll be talking about uh, screening brief intervention referral to treatment. And uh, I'll be playing the role of Abby Letcher. <laughs> and I have no uh, disclosure to make. Um, so, um, Esper. Uh, comprehensive Integrated Public Health Approach. It stands for Screening, uh, Brief Intervention, and Referral to Treatment. Um, it says here it's used for patients who are at higher levels of risk, who may already have substance use disorder, but really the point here is that it's useful for everyone. Um, and so universal screening is, is really the, the point. Um, so yes, you're identifying patients who may be identify, who may be having substance use disorder, but you're also um, talking to people who have uh, maybe lower levels of risk or higher, high or increasing levels of, of risk when it comes to their substance use. Uh, and a lot of studies have shown that it's effective for unhealthy alcohol use and increasing research shows that it's uh, effective for other substances as well. So uh, previously the focus has been for people who uh, met criteria for substance use disorder. Um, but with that focus, you're kind of, you know, there's a, an obvious gap you're not really addressing people who are at risk. Um, so, and that's why you're using this public health approach. For moderate, uh, rising, high risk, uh, and then also uh, risk for psychosocial or healthcare problems related to their substance use. So questions you may be asking, and I can see, you know, if I look at some of your faces, I can see you're asking, you're saying, Kevin, is Espert appropriate for a primary care setting? And I would say absolutely, Espert is designed specifically to address risky or harmful substances. So it's very useful in, in, a, in the setting of a family practice, for example, um, to make to, to screen universally. Um, and then you know we'll talk more about um, exactly how that's done. And of course, uh, talk more about uh, referral to treatment, which is really what we're working on here um, as a group in Project Echo. How can we? refer to treatment and also um, treat patients within our within our practices. And it says here how much hassle is involved. And I would say that certainly, um, I would say actually it's not much ha hassle at all. It's just, it's just part of workflow and office protocol. And we'll talk more about that in a bit too. Um, I have a tendency, I'll just tell everyone, I have a tendency to go through slides pretty quick. So be aware of that. Um, yeah. So, so um, it's, uh, Okay. Brief interventions have shown that it's very uh, low cost and effective, like we talked about, particularly for alcohol. Can, can, can you mute yourself, please? Yeah, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12. Okay, good. Not Kevin. Kevin's not, not muting Kevin. No, now he's muted. Kevin, Kevin's unmuted now. All right, was it, was it something I said? So, um, <laughs> so um, universal screening, um, that's really the whole point here, right? Um, I'm asking everyone, having a, a protocol in place, um, and I'll talk more about that if, if, uh, if we have time um, with sort of specific examples. Um, and then to have, have workflows in place so you can do a brief intervention. You know what you're gonna do, you know what you're gonna say, uh, depending on the results of your screening test. Um, and then have processes set up so that you can do the warm handoff or engage in treatment um, right in the office at any level of risk, uh, any level of scoring of these pre-screening and screening tests, which we'll go into now. So how to screen, this is just a, an algorithm that could, you could adapt this to your needs. The whole point is that it's the entire, it's a team approach uh, from the front desk, if you deem that that's, that's what makes sense to you 
um, and have different uh, roles for different people on the clinical team in terms of administering a pre-screen and a full screen, um, and then what to do about it. Examples would include the NIAA single question screen um, for alcohol use or the audit C, that's the one that we use. Um, and I'm talking about pre-screening now. And then the NIDAS single question drug screen, which is also what we use. Um, and then if you have a positive screen, you should ask for further assessment questions. And really that's the way that we're recommending that be done the way that we have been doing it in our office is a full screen. So the alcohol pre-screening, um, asking about alcoholic beverages, and then how many times in the past year have you had five uh, drinks or more per day? And then that leads you to, um, if, this, if the answer is yes, you're assessing for more specifically the frequency and, and quantity of weekly uh, drinking. Again, um, assessing the pattern of use, is there a presence of withdrawal uh, syndrome, uh, symptoms, excuse me, consequences of use in order for you to evaluate for alcohol use disorder and assess the need for withdrawal management. So that's um, alcohol use. And then the uh, NIDA single question screen, how many times in the past year have you used an illegal drug or used a prescription medication for non-medical reasons? Um, and then if, uh, if, any, if the response is positive, then you inquire further. Again, we're talking about uh, uh, using screening tools. So this can be done in a time efficient manner, which is just our reality in family practice and primary care, right? Uh, all of our reality, we're all pressed on time. So, uh, and that leads you to a DAS-10, so drug abuse screening test. And um, we're specifically concerned when it comes to prescription medications about opioids, benzodiazepines, uh, stimulants. And that's why we have treatment agreements for opioids and controlled substance agreements for um, other controlled substances. So key points for screening. Um, screen everyone for both alcohol and drug use using a validated tool. Um, and you're just going to do it as part of your normal workflows, right? Because it is, and it's just, it's just part of health screening. And, and with, when you in, do it that way and realize it that way, it reduces stigma. Um, and make sure that you, uh, you know, explore each substance because um, patients sometimes will use more than one. Um, use a formal assessment, which we've talked about, and um, use motivational interviewing skills, which we haven't talked about, but young Lisa did such a wonderful presentation last time. Um, I'd say just refer to young Lisa's presentation. <laughs> no, it was an excellent presentation on motivational interviewing skills, which is just core to, uh, to doing this and to doing this well. So, you know, it's just uh, to rehash that, it's, um, or to go back over that, evidence-based practice, collaborative, person-centered, uh, guiding and eliciting and strengthening motivation for change, okay? And, um, things that you could do, one of the challenges that we have um, is that sometimes the desire can, can be low or it seems low to us. Um, so there's different tools that we can use in motivational interviewing. Again, I'm not gonna go into it specifically, um, but um, this is one strategy you could use if the change seems, the motivation seems low. Um, you know, what concerns you about the most, the most about drinking in the long run? Um, and suppose you continue to continue as you have been um, what are the worst things that could happen? So uh, querying extremes is one technique that you could, that you could use to engage people. Uh, also important to avoid those, that sustained talk, don't fall into that trap when you're doing, you know, reflective listening. So, you know, if a patient says, for example, I was worried at first, but my liver test looked okay, so I'm not so worried. Um, and so rather than just say, uh, oh, you don't think really you have a drinking problem, you know, pick up on that, on that cue that uh, they are concerned about their liver tests. And so that's, that's an opening to discuss it further. And this is a big thing too, is uh, rolling with resistance, you know? So patients who are, for example, in this quote, I can't imagine myself not drinking, um, you know, it's who I am, it's what I do. Um, and so, and sometimes that could be a challenge as well. And so maybe the option may be at that time, you know, not to, uh, not really to, to engage, uh, Further, or to ask permission to engage further, to ask permission to uh, to uh, talk about this at the next visit. It's one of the benefits of being in um, family practice is that you have that ability, you develop that relationship, and you may you may find that um, in this particular office visit, it's not the right time to to talk, but you can ask for permission to bring it up next time. 
that's something that I've done effectively. Um, and also use uh, curiosity. Okay, um, at, you know, sort of you're coming to the conclusion of this visit. Um, you've elicited some chains talk. Um, so what is this going to look like? Uh, what are the best results? What, what is your future looking like with this change? Uh, and that can help as well. And be concrete when it comes to negotiating a treatment plan. Um, so uh, you know when you've elicited from the patient what their concerns, what their goals are, um, be specific. Maybe make a smart goal, um, and then follow up on those on those commitments. What the steps are? Uh, negotiate part of the treatment plan is you know what's the follow up visit? Asking for that again, asking for permission, and then following up specifically on what their their plan is that the, the patient has developed. Uh, and the treatment plan could be several things, depending on uh, the patient, where they're at, uh, what their issues may be. Um, medication may be appropriate. Um, uh, certainly mutual aid groups, uh, always focusing on, on wellness and referring to counseling um, when indicated. I think what I'm gonna do right now is um, I wanna be conscious of, uh, I haven't been paying attention to time. I, I have, I'd like to go to show to, to talk a little bit about the program or the, uh, the, the pilot uh, QI project that we did in, in our office in Hamburg and in other offices. Um, Abby, can I, can I ask you, what's my, uh, what's my time check? How much time do I have to talk? I think you've got another 10, 15 minutes and you can have more if you want it. Okay, sounds good, thanks. So um, this is a QI project that we did in the office um, towards the end of last year. And we were focusing on uh, incorporating expert in the annual wellness visit. And so, um, let me just do this. So um, the reason why we were focusing on the annual wellness visit, um, and this by the way is, is a benefit uh, uh, for Medicare population. So primarily age uh, 65 and older. Um, and it's focusing on health and wellness. Um, and when we consider substance use later in life, um, other things to consider would be that there, there are, of course, physiologic changes that can increase the risk of harm for substance use. Um, in addition to multimorbidity, uh, many medications that could, uh, that could be affected by the use of alcohol or other substances. Um, and then the increased risk of harm, you know, increased risk of falls and cognitive impairment, et cetera, all with serious consequences. In addition, if we're looking at, um, if we're thinking about meeting criteria for a substance use disorder or substance misuse in our older folks, um, you know, some things could be missed, right? So they, they, uh, the, they may be using the same amount that they took when they were younger, but with more adverse consequences. Um, and they may not realize that the substance use is problematic, especially when you think that a patient, an older patient may be no longer working. Um, they may be living alone. Um, and so for all these reasons, these things sometimes can go under the radar and be undetected. So, uh, and that's why we need to screen and why we need to screen universally. And it made sense that we would make this as part of the annual wellness visit, a yearly benefit. Um, it gives us a chance to focus on, on, on assessing for um, different health problems, as I said, that may go under the radar. Um, and the backbone of that is what's called the health risk assessment, right? So we go into health habits, what's their um, our, what about diet and exercise, specifically about alcohol use? And a more recent requirement, I think just about two years ago, was about screening for safe opioid use and misuse. So we incorporated that in our QI project with the help of Project RAMP. And it was really workflows that they developed that we adapted to our office. Um, and that was also at Hamburg, some of the, some of the physicians, clinicians at Hamburg, but also uh, clinicians at Treckler Town and Family Health Center. So it was a few different offices. Um, and the idea here is that um, we want to focus, um, yes, of course, on, on high risk, but really hazardous and harmful risk. Um, so the majority of the population um, completely or, uh, abstains or falls into the low risk uh, category, but the individual's risk can change at any time. Um, and the focus that we, again, that we want to focus on is for the purposes of ESPER, for the purposes of this discussion, is really hazardous risk and, uh, and harmful risk. And that's what ESPER helps to identify. 
So our workflow was to administer the initial screens, which we talked about before, the audit C, the NIDA single question screen. And that would trigger, if they screen positive, to a full audit and a full DAST. And the workflow is such that the office staff at the beginning, we adapted this over time with the PDSA cycles, but, but um, uh, they would actually hand out uh, when it, to the patient prior to coming into the room. Um, and the top of this sheet, which would, they would fill out these pre-screen questions, uh, would include this statement that they're integrating, we're integrating a new process so we can provide better health care and that your answers will remain confidential. So again, it's part of just routine health screening as it should be. And this is an example of the um, audit C and the NIDA question. So it was just a one page front and back, easy for, for patients to quickly complete. Um, and the clinical staff, as I said, would hand out the screen questionnaires and record the, the response, uh, note the scores in the, in the record. And if they uh, screened positive uh, based on, you know, so they, there wasn't any guesswork here. You just use the screening tool and based on the numbers you see, do they need to do a full screen? Uh, and then uh, in our workflow, um, depending on whether they scored, the, whether they did either the audit or the DAS-10, then the clinician would go in afterwards and, uh, and review that. And that was the opportunity to then um, do the, the BERT part of SBIRT. So, um, you know, based just on the scoring, uh, universal screening is the patient's amount becoming harmful or risky to and if so, based just on the numbers of those, of those tests, um, you know, it let you know whether or not you should be doing a brief intervention or a referral to treatment. So it gives, them the, gives us the opportunity for, depending on the score, for education, and again, brief intervention or referral to treatment. And, and the way we would do this is we had um, uh, a printed out laminated handout actually, so that would let us know exactly what the score is. Um, but it would also include information that we would show with the patient to better define, you know, what, what actually is a drink, because a lot of confusion about that, um, and what would be considered low risk or higher uh, than low risk amounts of drinks. And this would just be in a graphic that patients could see and easily understand. Um, and that would lead us to, again, the uh, brief intervention and the motivational interviewing that we've talked about, the importance of listening uh, reflectively. But what I wanted to do is show you, I'm going to forward, yeah, there it is. That's really what I wanted to show you here. Because the idea, I like to, I think it's so important to keep things uh, simple um, and make it doable and in the context of our time-pressed um, you know, reality of our office-based care. And so uh, this was a laminated front and back sheet that um, practitioners, clinicians can use you know, and show with the patient. You know, this is the amount of drinks. Uh, this is a standard drink. Um, and this is what's considered low risk and rising risk. Um, and then also just some little, uh, um, sort of uh, tips to words and phrases that you could use in addition to using that motivational interviewing ruler, um, readiness for change. Um, also on the back of it, uh, uh, this laminated sheet, um, specific, again, phrases that you could use that would help the process, to help the discussion when you're utilizing motivational interviewing. So um, straight to the results um, and sort of the learnings. So, you know, prior to initiating this pilot or this QI project, we really had inconsistent screening. Um, and we had more consistent screening, but still, it's still uh, not as consistent as we would like it to be. It's about 50% of the time based on chart review. Um, so we did some changes to make it more, to make it uh, smoother and easier, laminated tools, for example, uh, changing who did the scoring. Um, but the challenges included sort of um, consistency of workflow, as you can see by that 50% usage of the workflow. Um, clinical staff time was probably the reason for the problem with the consistency. Clinician time as well. Um, if you're time pressed, even something as efficient as this seemed daunting. Um, and the results showed lower detection rates in older adults. Um, but I would say that that really, mean, when I say that, I'm talking about diagnosis of substance use disorder, not actually indication of, of, uh, of um, some risky use. 
which again, I think is the real benefit of, or um, a real benefit of SBIRT. But there were a lot of benefits to the pilot. So, because it established a, a workflow for us, which we quickly expand, expanded to all adults. One of the physicians I was working with, like by the second week, he was just sort of using this workflow for all of his adults, which is really the, the, the point of it. Uh, it helped us to refine uh, um, our workflows um, during this time that we were uh, doing this pilot, uh, or maybe shortly afterwards, there was the availability of the CCT referral. Um, the processes in place to do know how you're going to do a warm handoff, who you're going to work with. Um, and then now, uh, since then, uh, um, the, the development of PACMAP, um, which is allowing us to provide that care for the patients who meet criteria for substance use disorder in our offices. Um, and this, again, this shows us just the uh, work that we've done with Project Ramp and showing us a specific outline, depending on the results of our expert screening, you know, where we would go uh, next, depending on the results and if patients meet criteria for substance use disorder, um, who would we connect with? So that is our workflow. Um, I wanted to have time for questions. So let me just open it up. Does anyone have any questions either about the project that we did, about how we're using SBIRT in our offices, or any other questions about SBIRT? Comments. You know, what does it look like where you are, or your own primary care doctor? Are they asking these questions? <laughs> Abby, did I didn't really catch that question? Can you say it again? It was a, a question for the group. Of you know, oh, okay. also feel free to make any kind of comments about your own experiences, um, including when you went to your own primary care doctor. Um, what did it look like there? Uh, you know, there's been a lot of emphasis lately and more evidence coming out that this is an important role in primary care, and, and yet it's been tricky to change. So uh, I guess my question while I'm sitting here talking is uh, what kind of things helped your office buy in and agree to do this kind of work? Oh, yeah. Yeah, thanks for that. But, so. The, um, it, it involved some uh, education um, and with our with Project Ramp actually. So we had a couple of presentations about um, about the the process, um, about the importance of SBIRT, about substance use disorder, um, and so that was really um, I think helpful. Uh, in addition, the clinical staff that I uh, worked with did a presentation to the um, to the rest of the clinical staff, the nurses and the medical assistants. Um, we had. Um, the clinicians who were involved, um, you know, met at the outset uh, and then sort of met informally throughout uh, to sort of work and refine the process. Um, so it was, it was, I think we're so used to initiating new uh, processes and workflows um, that there wasn't a big hurdle or hassle here. Um, I did want to, I wanted to take this opportunity to talk about some sort of spe uh, specific cases to kind of, um, you know, make it more understandable rather than just sort of didactic. I had intended to be more interactive than I did, and then I just kept on talking. I apologize, but um, the the I I think the, the real benefit in reflecting back on this was like like patients who who did have who were unaware that the amount that they've used was risky, um, and they again did not meet criteria for substance use disorder. But for example. One, uh, one patient I'm thinking of right now who was just here for his regular, um, you know, chronic disease management, his diabetes and hypertension, and um, uh, it shows you sort of the trap to not fall into when it comes to just sort of, you know, judging people, you know, you just sort of look at him, he looked a little bit like, um, you know, everyone remembers from the old Seinfeld show, George Costanza, and he, he was a middle-aged guy, and he was an accountant, and, um, you know, in, in, in doing these screening questions. So you might sort of come to it saying, oh, this is a surprise to me that someone is, uh, you know, has misuse, which is just such a, you know, um, uh, again, uh, it, it, it's not good care um, to make any kind of judgment uh, before going in to the room or before starting a, a discussion. 
Um, but using the, these, these uh, pre-screening and screening tools, it turns out that he uh, you know, used cocaine fairly regularly. Um, he was, in addition to his job um, as an accountant, he was an amateur musician. And on the weekends, that's what he did for enjoyment and, and that's what he did to relax. And so we had, it sort of opened up the discussion you know, just using this specific technique, following the pre-screen, following the screen. Um, it was an opportunity to talk about, uh, first of all, to ask permission and to talk about what he thought about his, his use and, and using, I actually used the motivational, you know, interviewing ruler technique um, and then uh, at the first visit, he didn't want to talk about it. So I asked permission to talk the next time, which, which he was open to it. He had done a lot of reflecting since because I raised the issue and he had a lot of thoughts about the reason why it was, um, he was no longer comfortable with, uh, with uh, the use of cocaine. He had a plan in place to reduce it. And then the next time we met, um, which was either four or six months later, he had decided to stop completely on his own. And I'm like, oh, this actually works. <laughs> I should be using it. Um, and I've had several other uh, examples for people um, with uh, risky alcohol use as well. That's great. Uh, you know, having your own experiences really can help tell that story of why this matters and why it's important in primary care, right? <laughs> That's really amazing. I just have a, a, a comment, Kevin. I think you know, as we think about potential barriers to implementing something like this in the primary care setting or, or any setting where, you know, providers aren't, aren't used to really making this part of the day, what I'm noticing is that, that um, you know, you're bringing up such an important point that sometimes it's just in the asking. So I think the feedback we've gotten is that people are afraid because the resources aren't solidly in place in every practice for what to do if the patient screens positive, you don't want to ask the question, right? Because what am I, what am I going to do with that, that positive screen? Um, but as we build these resources, right, through PACMAT and all the work that this whole group is doing, even the asking is the in, part of the intervention, right? Like just getting that, that patient knowing that you're not there to, to judge by asking the question. They know that, that, that the setting is a place that they can feel comfortable bringing up any concerns and it might be in three months that they bring something up right and that you say you know we ask everybody this we're not judging you we are this is sort of a, a process we use um, as part of the care we provide uh, and I think it, it plants a seed um, for that, that helps reduce stigma and make it possible for someone to um, to discuss this and because as you mentioned the brief intervention is really motivational interviewing based um, the initial response is just to reflect back. You don't have to fix the situation as the, 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 help, the clinician. You just, um, the first step is just to reflect back what you're hearing. And I think if everybody knows that that's really, that's the crux of this piece, that there's no tremendous pressure to fix what you hear about on screening, uh, right away at least, um, that uh, the, so much positivity comes out of just asking the question, and reflecting back what you hear. Uh, and, I, and I appreciate kind of you hearing that and talking about that and showing how that, that set the tone for the patient uh, to, to even you know, make, make some decisions on his own um, but, you know, between his, his visits. So pretty awesome. Thanks. Any reflections or uh, comments from our behavioral health folks? know other teenagers who are using. Mm -hmm. So I think that might be a missed opportunity if we're just looking at something like, oh, it's negative, don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. That might be something to consider. Right. Yeah, that's such an important point. Um, 
and something that I that um, that I um, in reflection I should have communicated more clearly. The the workflow is it does recommend that um, after you screen um, and a patient screens negative, it's still an opportunity. You know, yes, for positive reinforcement, but also an op opportunity for education as well. Absolutely. Yeah, and I love, I love the point also that, that part of that education with a teenager in particular is about your peers and are they using and that that might be kind of a, a sign of impending risk, right? And Heather, I think, um, can I take a moment for you to give a commercial for yourself and what is the role of a CFRS? What's a CFRS? So a CFRS is a certified family recovery specialist. Um, it is someone whose life has been impacted by the substance use of another person. I lost my younger brother to a heroin overdose almost three years ago and kind of went through the motions myself of realizing there's not a whole lot out there as far as family recovery and dealing with the grief as related to this specific field. So pursue the CFRS to try to help more families out there. Thank you. Any other thoughts? I'd love to hear from someone who hasn't spoken up in an echo before. I know there's some of you out there, people faces. Drew, did you have a... Abby, I just... I just wanted to point out that there's a question in the chat from Nayan about whether we've been able to continue this workflow um, of the screening questions since we've gone more virtual and in the virtual space. Great. Drew, do you want to take that one? Um, the answer for me is no. Um, it would be great if we had a virtual concierge. Um, but one of the challenges is that we're being asked to do everything we would normally do in a 20 minute visit in the virtual space with, um, without the person rooming the patient. Um, so that means a lot of this workflow of somebody to ask these questions um, up front is not present in the virtual space. Um, so it's, it's been a real challenge, you know, not just for this. I mean, we're working the whole project on vital signs and how you even just get a blood pressure in, in the virtual space. And I think these vital questions, um, which in many ways, you know, are as important as those vital signs, are something that we're also overlooking. Um, and um, so it's been a real challenge for us, I think, um, at the Family Health Center. And, and I believe I'm safe saying that's been a trouble throughout LVPG, though some offices that have um, been able to retain staff and, and that sort of stuff, I think, may still be doing some of that virtual concierge uh, piece, but I don't think very many. Um, so it has been a real struggle for me personally, I think, um, through, through most of our family medicine offices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the team team approach is a little harder in the virtual space. Kevin and you guys, how have you been doing with that with virtual? Same, same as Drew. Okay. Yeah, so we haven't been incorporating that. Um, at least I haven't. Uh, but I, with Hamburg, our, uh, you know, we, we, we just went back to face to face. So uh, uh, we just turned so, so on a dime and then you know, opened up and really the recommended telehealth or digital health um, or video visits would be like 20%, but we're nowhere near that. Um, so, so we're kind of back to our usual workflows, to be honest with you. Okay. And then I'll mention that at NHCLV, we also transitioned to a new electronic health record. So hard to say which way is up, um, but uh, not consistent practice at this moment either. Uh, so, as with any big practice change, <laughs> revisiting and revisiting and seeing how is this practice workflow, how is it adapted for this moment in time. But that's so important. All right, I'm putting out one last lasso for anybody who's got something else to add. Uh, someone that maybe hasn't spoken too much. I just I just wanted to add I think um, it's great what you what you guys have been doing Kevin um, back to the fact that with you know doing visits virtually it's kind of stalled that um, I just wanted to throw out what we're seeing in the hospital is you know really steady really heavy 
you know, use. And I think, you know, it's so much of it is precipitated by um, COVID. And we're see, seeing really sick people, um, younger and younger, and it's um, it's really wearing. And and they they come they're coming in, and it's steady. And we've had um, a bunch of overdose overdose deaths. Emmaus High School buried their their um, football captain on Monday. Um, he just graduated in June. And, um, and this is kind of, you know, and it's getting to be steady. And that's um, really concerning for me. And I just wanted to throw that out there that we need to really be mindful um, about how important these screenings are. And I think with that too, that circles me back to the importance of talking to teenagers specifically. Um, this person was someone that my son knew and went to school with. So I think these conversations in primary care and households are critical, even if the person's not using, to go a step further and see what are your friends doing right now? How are you handling grief for that matter? And this has a big impact in, in our community in many, many different ways. Um, thank you, Paige, for sharing how it looks from where you stand. Sometimes we don't see all of that full picture from the different places where we are, whether you're in a CCT or in a primary care practice. Um, the impact might look a little bit different. It's so helpful to hear from each other. What does it look like where you, where you sit? <laughs> okay so so the next thing that we're modeling today partly out of necessity um but also because this is something that's available and i've been sort of throwing that call out for anybody who's who hasn't spoken too much to to feel invited to participate um our second case today is an off-the-cuff case and you may remember that drew gave us an off-the-cuff case one day too and um you know anybody got a case and drew had one uh, so last night we had a, anybody got a case and Heather said, yeah, I got a case. So Heather's got a, a case for us that we can take on in our last half hour. Um, and I will be taking notes as you go. Do you need me to project the note taking thing or do you want to just talk and I'll write and, and we'll all listen? So I kind of like outlined. Okay, you do your thing. PowerPoint. I think I have this. Okay. <laughs> okay, so the person that I want to discuss today is a 36 year old Caucasian female. She is not aware of the presentation and has not helped to develop any of the questions. As far as strengths, I would say that she is a very kind and resilient person. My burning question that I have is how can we help her become ready? to enter recovery and regain some hope in her life. Um, this individual has a history of opiate use disorder and polysubstance abuse. She's currently abusing meth and clonopin or Xanax. She has two inpatient mental health hospitalizations recently. She has been previously diagnosed with bipolar, um, depressive disorder, panic disorder, and anxiety. She continues to struggle with her mental health on a pretty daily basis. Um, it appears that she does have very poor self-esteem and one of her triggering factors is loneliness. She's been really struggling with the isolation due to COVID-19. All of her groups and sessions are being done over the phone, so she feels a major disconnect from the things that she used to be doing. Um, she does have the support of her parents, but the relationships are very codependent. Um, she also has codependent relationships with an ex-boyfriend and the father of her five-year-old daughter. She will often sneak out of the window in her bedroom to go meet up with the father of the daughter and go use meth. 
She does also have a 13 year old son. There is current CYS involvement, um, but that doesn't seem to be very beneficial right now. Um, most recently when I talk to her, she verbalizes that she doesn't know if she wants to be in recovery because she does want to use. She's been stable with her OUD on Supplicade, but admitted that she would not continue getting the Supplicade if it wasn't for her mother basically dragging her to the clinic once a month. Um, I have I've attempted engagement over the past, I want to say we've been working with her for three years now. Um, I've attempted engagement with women's empowerment groups, 12-step um, support groups, mommy and me groups. We've recently talked about inpatient programs, PHP. We've also spent significant time trying to go over self-care activities that could bring more quality to her life. We've talked about her likes and dislikes, and the only thing she can easily tell me is that she likes to do drugs. Um, she doesn't find that anything else in her life fulfills her at this point. She does have a CPS to help um, with the mental health, but again, that's all over the phone right now. She was dropped down to outpatient at White Deer Run, um, but with speaking with her counselor, we're finding that it's because she's not being honest about her use. She's doing psychiatry through an outpatient provider that's local. And she's also engaged with LCSW sessions at NHCLB, but is not always compliant with those appointments. She does live with her mother, father, and two children. Um, education is high school. Current legal involvement, she has seven pending misdemeanor charges following a DUI in possession. Um, she was working full time at a department store, but is currently on short term disability due to her mental health. I don't know about labs, I think it's open the chart. Okay. Um, substance use history, like I said, she does have a history of poly substance abuse. She is abusing meth and benzos right now. The OUD seems to have been stable on MAT sublocade. Um, her psychiatrist did refuse to prescribe her benzos, but she feels like she absolutely needs these. So she's been buying either Klonopin or Xanax off the street. Um, current medications, Sublocade, Topamax, Trazodone, Clonidine, and Buspirum. Um, Behavioral health treatment, like I said, she's going to White Deer Run. She's doing psychiatry and she has LCSW sessions at Neighborhood Health. Proposed diagnosis, OUD, polysubstance abuse, um, the bipolar, panic disorder, and depressive disorder. Some of our treatment goals that we've tried to work on over the past three years are stabilizing her mental health and substance use obtaining independent housing. Um, she's very scared of change, I want to say. We've talked about transitional housing programs and things of that nature, but she won't take a step forward to try them. Um, improving relationships with her children, trying to decrease the codependency with her parents, Try to engage her in outpatient women's groups to try to build support and self-worth and also improve her self-care. But we just keep, keep like seem to be cycling mm -hmm. back to the bad. Yeah. yeah. Ouch. Right? That's my person. Okay. I don't, I don't. <laughs> Let's see if I can uh, pull that one together, which is our 36-year-old woman who's uh, got a history of opiate use disorder on sublocate and poly substance use disorder. She's currently not using opioids but using meth and benzos um, and appears to be at a crisis of motivation and depending on outside motivators and relationships for the care that she's receiving. Though she's received a lot of care 
um, at this moment, the concern is um, that her mental health system symptoms are becoming more severe and her, um, her motivation is tending more toward use than recovery. One thing I did forget, she does have the medical marijuana card and it's on that too. So interesting. All right. Um, clarifying questions from the group. There's there's a lot going on here. What do you want to know about this young woman? It's quite an amazing off the cuff, by the way. I think everyone <laughs> has something like I am. <laughs> Abby, this is Stacy Cook. Hi, Stacy. Hi. Uh, I'm just wondering if she identifies any past traumas? She does. Um, does not really openly disclose them, though. So she says, yes, I have trauma, but I'm not telling you what? Yeah, like there's things I know from my other position because of working with the daughter's father that she hasn't disclosed to me. Uh -huh. um, so there are things there and abusive relationships, but she doesn't like to talk about it. Yeah, it, it is worth mentioning that, that we know all the players in this little triangle because mm -hmm. they all have come here for treatment. And have you also worked with her mother in, in your CFR? I have tried. Okay. Yes. Um, specifically during her recent inpatient hospitalizations, I actually went out to the family to try to provide support. We talked about you know, best steps forward, things to do for the children, and the mother would actually flip it and be like, Heather told me to do this, so then Crystal would get mad, or the patient would get mad at me. Um, so it, it's very sticky and difficult working with the family in this one. Questions out there? What do you want Hi, this is Yamalisa. Um, aside from loneliness, has she identified anything else that she wants to work on? She talks about wanting to get her own place, um, but she realizes financially this is not something that she could do, and she's not willing to consider a transitional housing type situation that would give her time to bank money, get on her feet, and get her own place. So ambivalence is what I'm hearing. Okay. More questions out there. What's your burning desire to know about this person? This is Angie. Has she ever been evaluated for ADD or ADHD? Tell us more, Amy. What do you think? So, did I hear you say one of her drugs of choice was methamphetamines? Um, so, one of the hunches there is that we know a lot of people with methamphetamine use disorder may be treating uh, an undiagnosed ADD or ADHD diagnosis, and that they find that the methamphetamine helps treat those symptoms. Ouch. Right. Other, other questions? Abby, um, does she, did she have previous inpatient stays? For drug and alcohol or for mental health? Or uh, either. Yes. Uh, yeah, she's had both. Multiple? Um, two recent mental health. And I want to say the last time she was inpatient, DDAP was a little over a year ago. Do you know where that was? Was it White Deer Run? Not off the top of my head. But she's had relationships with a few different organizations. Yes. Yeah. 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 And she wouldn't be open to that again? You think? Yeah, I've tried that. And most recently, I've tried talking to her about looking into Cadenzia or Liberté, where she might be able to take her daughter. 
and she doesn't want to consider that either. Any CRS involvement? No CRS. She does have a CPS. Thanks, Paige. More questions. I love questions. I have one other question. This is Yamalisa. Um, you said that you guys have discussed her likes and dislikes. Uh, what are some of those? So we've sat there during sessions and actually like did her makeup, did her nails, try to focus on things that she actually enjoys and can do on her own. But it seems like she lacks, I don't know the right word for this. She won't do it on her own. Like if I'm not there, she won't engage in these things. And when I talk to her about likes, the only thing she tells me, she likes drugs. She doesn't know what else she likes. Oh, that feels so stuck, doesn't it? She likes not being alone. There you go. <laughs> yeah, sometimes the power of a good reframe is really important, right? She likes Heather. <laughs> what are some thoughts any of our, our uh, CCT or behavioral health folks have a, a question or a thought? Let's go ahead and start thinking about some suggestions. What are our suggestions, ideas that we might have for this person? I, I like the suggestion of maybe some engagement with a certified recovery specialist, you know, somebody like Emily, um, just, you know, have a conversation. Um, that would be my suggestion. Yeah, yeah. Tell us a little bit, Paige, about, oh, uh, as we go into the dark here, um, tell us a little bit about why, why a CRS might be a good fit for her. Well, she's going, to, she's going to know that she's not being judged and that the person that she's talking to really understands how crazy her life is and, and how, you know, how hard it is to keep that, to keep it all together um, as best as she can. And, you know, I, I can just, I can just see Emily going there and, you know, talking about specific events or, you know, have you ever done this or, you know, isn't this crazy and, and trying to, you know, kind of normalize it, but address it. And, you know, and then there's that, that hope piece, you know, that she was able to stop eventually um, and, and how she did that. And um, just hearing that it's, it's possible and, you know, there's, there's hope, you know, and that's really, I think, the reason most people, you go to mutual aid um, meetings, it's, you know, I, like I personally would go, or even when I was still um, in an active addiction, I would go because I would hear hope there. And I think if she was able to have a couple conversations with Emily, she could get that. And then, and then there's the little voice who, you know, keeps saying, Maybe you can do this. Maybe you can do this. Mm -hmm. That that's why I think um, it would be a good idea. Thank you, Kate. That was absolutely beautiful. The CRS is a is a thought. Um, we love Emily. I think she's focusing more on outreach right now as things are so. That's out there, but we have other CRSs that are available too, and, and that's a growing role in our community. And, and um, something that I encourage us all to tap into as much as possible. And, and all you behavioral health folks out there know that, that we've got our referral mechanism, and Sophia and Yamalisa can help hook that up, right? <laughs> uh, other suggestions? Hi everybody, it's Sophia here. Um, I just want to 
think I just want to say that Paige, that is a wonderful idea for the CRS. Um, you know, I was looking at her laundry list of behaviors and, you know, she's very avoidant. She's not willing to address anything. And I think the CRS meeting her at that level and just being that little pinprick in, the, in that tunnel could help her because she's really just focusing on all of these maladaptive behaviors and not wanting to look at what's really going on. So I, I think referring her for CRS services and having Emily or Corinne uh, talk with her about this would be perfect. Now this is Angie, thanks so much for the case. I think it's a really interesting case. Uh, if possible, and if she, I, I might see if we could do a screening for ADHD with her. One of the ones there's has decent validity as a screener, um, it's ASRS. I um, uh, can't think of what the acronym stands for, but I'll send it to you. Um, yeah, and see, the other thing is it might, as you're trying to understand what the drug, she loves the drug use and they're doing something, they're serving a purpose for her, right? So one of the MI techniques is to understand, as we know, the pros and the not so good things about um, her use. It's a four quadrant box. So the good, the not so good things about use. You start with the good things. What does she like? Like pull up a chair next to, I love my drug use really understanding how the methamphetamine use is helping her and this love affair that she has with it. And then the not so good things about use is the next set of discussion questions. Um, and you really let her fill in these boxes. You let her have the narrative, right? The next one is the not so good things about change. What scares her about change? What what isn't good about change, all of these stories that she has, then you end on the good things about change. So, and I'll send you how you move around the discussion. The MI science around that is the fidelity to that pattern in the discussion. Um, and it uh, helps pull out a narrative, decrease a resistance to talking about those things. And it helps, it's going to help you develop discrepancies to kind of get at her ambivalent state. You really want to pull out that ambivalent state. So, um, and hopefully it'll help you understand the role that methamphetamine is serving and if uh, ADD or ADHD is part of the story. That's all for me. Thank you. Thanks, that's beautiful. And I'll have to draw that one for you too. We have time for one more suggestion. And do you have any reflections that you want to share with the group at all about where might you go with this? Um, well, I'm seeing her again Friday, so I'll definitely talk to her again about CRS involvement. Um, but I definitely like doing that chart and having her kind of walk through that with me, so I'm going to try that as well. Yeah, I, I love that the tools of motivational interviewing, and we've got some really great experts here in the, the room with us, but how those tools help us when we feel as stuck as the patient does, right? And uh, how can we get in there and 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 find that ambivalence so that you've got something to work with. I love that. It's really helpful. So thank you, Andy, for sharing a concrete example of how to pull one of those tools out of that toolbox and put it to use here. Because uh, what I know is that Heather, you care a lot about this person, have invested a lot, and it's hard to have those feelings of being stuck. Um, that's great. So let's let's move into a closing, and I'll. Uh, Call you all out in order that I have you here. Um, but uh, as a closing, just a brief share of uh, how's it going with your intention or what is something that you're bringing away from today. And I'm going to start with you, Yamalisa. Hi. Um, so today, hearing the, the cases, I mean, I love the didactic, but always the cases are, are my favorite. So I think it's, it's wonderful to be able to have this open discussion and, and really address these needs and just listen to the different um, options that are available to, to meet our, our patients where they're at. So I'm definitely um, taking that information with me to, 
share forward. Thank you. Yeah, Sophia. Sophia. Oh, sorry, my mute was uh, <laughs> muted. Um, no, it was um, really these both of these cases are challenging. So I really want to commend um, the teams that are working with them and sticking with them and trying to find solutions to meet them where they're at. Um, but yes, I would echo up Yamalisa and say, I, I really enjoy the challenges that um, we're trying to work through. And you know, this is a great space to do so. And um, I'm definitely going to take away what I learned and uh, continue to share it. Thank you. Angie. Yeah, thanks so much for the collective space. Appreciate uh, working with people on cases and I'm starting my day like this every, the third Wednesday of every month. Thanks. Love having you here, Angie. Judy. Um, so it was it was great to um, hear the, these we have really difficult cases, but to also um, just know that um, the care the providers are re being very compassionate and empathetic to their patients and continuing to work through all of the. Um, any type of barriers that those patients may may bring it up and try to, um, you know, just bring, um, you know, healthcare health to them. So it was very very um, interesting. Thanks, Judy. So glad that you're with us. Uh, Paige. Uh, great cases, and I just kind of reflecting. Um, about how, how difficult the cases are. And, um, you know, this is tough work. And I'm, I'm just so grateful that we have all of you available to, to help with um, this population. Thank you. We love you. Christopher. It was interesting to hear about the application of Esper in primary care, so that excites me um, and something I want to tell my docs in my offices about. Be the change, right? Patricia. <laughs> um, as always, I, you know, come away from this with uh, good perspectives from everybody, but I'm going to agree with Chris listening to how uh, one practice did SBIRT makes me want to get all my practices to do it. <laughs> so that is a uh, it was a good day, good cases. Right, right. Well, how do we get our own practices to recognize what's going on even more deeply? I think that leads me to Jillian. All right. So yeah, really, um, really tough cases. And I'm just reflecting that sometimes I think we, we hear tough cases like that and think, oh my gosh, we need like a, some specialty care, right? Like some licensed drug and alcohol treatment comes to mind. And I think what a reflection for me is that licensed drug and alcohol is, is phenomenal treatment, but oftentimes isn't quite a good fit for patients like the two that we just discussed today. Oftentimes those, those treatment uh, approaches are pretty rigid. And if you, if you aren't able to comply um, with the, the rigorous schedule, um, you're out of the program. And this is when I, I see a lot of magic in um, integrating this work into the primary care setting. Maybe it's, maybe it's family medicine, maybe it's OB, maybe it's internal medicine, wherever this happens, um, because that's a practice where you're not gonna kick someone out. You're gonna say like, like Kevin modeled for us, let's see you in a couple of weeks. I wanna, let's, if it's okay with you, I'd like to address this again. I'm here for you, I'm not judging, right? That it's a, a pull the patient in closer to us rather than a, a push a patient away for being quote, you know, non-compliant. And diving into these cases, I think really modeled uh, why that's important uh, and, and why primary care can be the place that, 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 that the whole patient is met uh, where they are, so. Thank you for that. The whole package today was a great, great echo. Thanks, Jillian. Kevin. I just have to say that uh, Jillian, I think, understands primary care better than I do. It's wonderful to hear Jillian talk about primary care. Um, I, um, so, yeah, it was a great, um, the cases I, uh, 
I always learn so much from the cases. And, um, you know, sometimes I learn from the case, I'm listening to the case and I'm, and I'm just sort of thinking, myself, wow, this is tough. What, what would I do next? And then there's, and I think other people are feeling the same thing. There's a sort of, you know, silence and it takes a while to process it and then come up with, um, with ideas. Uh, and then inevitably uh, people come up with, with ideas for, for um, challenging situations. So um, learn, a, learn a lot. Thanks. Gotta go. Thank you, Kevin. Gina. Hi, um, I enjoyed presenting the case and I definitely enjoyed getting uh, all of the feedback from the team. There were certainly some things that I didn't think of um, in either scenario because I talked to Heather about her cases as well. So I thought today was a really like informative and enjoyable echo and I hope we can have more of these in the future. Thanks, Gina. Stacy. Beyond the, the learning component and, and hearing about other people's cases, I really value everyone's openness to both receive and give the feedback. So thank you for that today. Yeah, thank you, Stacy. That's community building is what it's all about here, right? Um, Ken. Ah, yes. Uh, I was glad to hear the first case. Unfortunately, I had a meeting at the second one, so I had not heard in the past hour. Uh, so, but it was, I was glad to be able to uh, give some input onto the, the first case and hear some of the cases that you guys have to deal with. Great. Thank you, Ken. It was, it was great having you. Good to see you. Um, look, and our last class. Uh, Jasmine. Um, um, I enjoyed that we were able to sit and talk about two really good cases today. I appreciate that where everyone is able to walk away with something new. I think today was uh, definitely productive and um, I hope for future cases. Mm -hmm. Heather, um, I definitely appreciate the feedback on the cases because they do get a little tricky at times and also learning about like the different tools that we could be using that we might not know. Naomi. Mm -hmm. um, kind of piggybacking off the Jillian um, about PRS's PPL group and how we kind of like push sometimes for like the DVAP and not always the right situation. How important a CFR or and a CPS can be in someone's life because they're feeling alone or thinking that they are. All right. And then from my point, uh, one of the things that I love about these cases being presented today and together is, uh, you know, they came for treatment for opioid use disorder. And actually that piece is going okay. Um, concerning, but going okay. They're getting their MAT and they're doing okay. It's, it's the rest of everything that happens next that that we need this whole team to help us sort of sort through. Um, but these are you know, not treatment failures. This is this is the work and it's beautiful work for us to do together as a team and as a community. So thank you all for being here. We have some reminders that we'll be sending out the um, survey today. Please fill it out. It helps us have feedback about what to do better and any suggestions you have. Uh, we are eager to hear them. Uh, what else do we have for reminders, Naomi? We're preparing some certificates. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I might reach out to individuals just to make sure, like, if there's any other credentials that you might want on your certificate. So look for an email from myself. Great. All right, and then we will see you the next third. Wednesday, 7 a.m., same channel. All right, thank you and have a beautiful day. Bye. My coffee's getting cold. <laughs>